We standing on the word of scripture. If you were to be standing with you, never are we gonna budge. We ain't going nowhere. We standing on the word of scripture. If you were to be standing with you, because of his grace and love, we ain't going nowhere. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 23 of Faith and Beliefs Refuted. I am your host, The Evangelical Norm. So today, we are going to talk about prophets. David is going to tell us about what the Mormons think about the prophets and why they think they need them and so on. And then we're going to talk about what the Bible says about prophets and why we do not need them. So, with that being said, let's go ahead and jump in. And let David take us through the prophets. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believe that anciently God communicated his will to the world through prophets like Noah, Abraham, and Moses. This has always been the pattern God has followed, and we believe he's still following that pattern. Just like in ancient times, there are prophets today. That said, there seems to be a bit of confusion about what a prophet is and what a prophet is not. Let's talk about it. Okay, before we get into that, um, it's not always a pattern that God has followed. God has used a lot of different things to speak to his people. He uses prophets, he uses kings, he's used priests, he's used uh, donkeys to talk to his people. So to say that prophets is the way that he's always done it is actually not true. Um, he has used prophets quite a few times. Uh, and it's, it's a regular thing that God does is yes, he uses prophets quite a bit, but it's not the only way. And it's not, uh, the, I would, I, I could say maybe it's a default that God uses prophets. We, we recognize that, but he uses others that are not considered to be prophets. So. prophet, whether ancient or modern, is no more or less human than you or I. Prophets are capable of sin. They can make mistakes. There are plenty of well-documented mistakes Latter-day Saint prophets have made in the past. Some people like to use those mistakes as evidence that those men weren't prophets, but mistakes are to be expected. If the lives of ancient prophets were as well-documented as the lives of some modern prophets, I think we'd be able to find plenty of questionable decisions to complain about. Even with the documentation we do have, we see ancient prophets making all sorts of calls we'd probably condemn in a second nowadays. All right, he's going to go into a slew of some. Some are valid, some are not. Uh, some of the things he says are are just partially true. And and this is a thing that that generally... People, Mormon apologists will do, especially the guys from Saints Unscripted, Kwaku, David, um, those are the only two I really deal with much in a apologetic manner, um, but they will use partial truths, they'll tell you something but not give you references for those somethings, um, and, uh, and they, they speed through them real quick without giving you any time to really kind of digest exactly what it is so here he is he's setting up the straw man argument to say that because biblical prophets sin you can't use things like uh brigham young's racism or mountains meadow massacre or joseph smith uh destroying the the printing press or joseph smith and polygamy or joseph smith and money digging you can't use those things against the mormon prophets because then you have to discount the biblical prophets not quite the same thing but the the main thing is is i don't use and i would say that there are a lot of evangelists that use that um in conversations with mormons especially on the street you're not going to find many apologists who use that as an argument to 
discount the LDS prophets? Is it a horrible thing? An, a, a, a scathing indictment against the Mormons? Yeah, Joseph Smith did some pretty bad stuff. Brigham Young did some pretty bad stuff. But, um, and some of the Old Testament prophets did some, some bad stuff. But that's not the, the main thing that disqualifies LDS prophets, especially men like Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, from being prophets. And we'll get to that at the end. But we'll let him continue. Paul said some pretty sexist stuff. Peter assaulted a government employee. Jonah tried to abandon Nineveh and he literally ran from God. Noah got drunk and ran around without his clothes on. Nathan told King David that God had approved of his decision to build a temple. God had to gently remind the prophet that no, that was not the case. Oops. We got to work on our communication. Does this make them bad people? No, it just makes them people. Prophets are also products of their time. They're not outside the influence of their culture. The prophet Elijah rounded up priests of a false rival religion and had them killed. Can you imagine if... Okay, this is one we're going we're gonna to deal with, and I'm going to actually pull this up in the Bible um, and read this, because this is one that, that really irritated me um, and uh, has caused me to actually re-record this video about four times, because it... Um, yeah, it's just... He... He doesn't give the proper um, context of what happens. Um, so this is, of course, this is uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And I'm trying to find the... Okay, so we're going to be in 1 Kings 18, um, starting in 20. So Ahab sent all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Ahab gathered the prophets. Um, and Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long until you go limping between two different opinions? If, Lord, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bowls be given to us, and let them choose one bowl for themselves, and cut it into pieces, and lay it on the wood. But put no fire to it, and I will prepare the other bowl, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. And you will call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God and then all the people answered, It is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets, Baal, choose for yourself one bowl and prepare it first, for you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took the bowl, and we go on. Um, the prophets of Baal, I, I'm going to su uh, summarize for a minute because uh, time. Um, so they call out to their God. They're beating themselves. They're drawing blood. Elijah is mocking their God. He's saying maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe he had to make a potty. Um, then Elijah said to all the people, come near me. And the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, and whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, as great as would contain the two seas of seed. And he put the wood in in order and cut the bowling pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, Fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering in the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. Do it a third time. They did it the third time, and the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. Now, mind you, this is a drought-ridden Israel right now. So this, he, he's put enough water on this bowl to saturate the ground to the point that the water is standing. Um, and at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah came near and said, O God, O Lord God of, Israel, of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known to this day that you are God in Israel. And I am your servant, and I have done these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me. This is the people may this that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. 
When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slaughtered them there. So, there's a little more to the story than just Elijah gathered up prophets of a of rival religion and had them put to death. These were these were false prophets that uh, that had led the the nation of Israel astray, and so and God demonstrated His power not by just some feelings, not by a burning in the bosom, but by fire from heaven that consumed bull and stone and dirt and wood and water consumed it all proving that he is God and by his command those prophets were put to death so David's little scenario here is deceitful and I'm going to say that again it's deceitful and this is what they do and I'm accusing you David yes I am I'm calling you out you are, you are a twister of truth in order to maintain your doctrine. And I get irritated every time I come across this. You are trying to validate false prophets of your religion by twisting the truth about prophets, true prophets of God. And I'm warning you, David, you're going to have to answer to God for that one day. Let's move on. Christians did that today with people from other religions. Not cool, but apparently that's how they rolled in Elijah's era. Does that make it okay? Well, not to us in our era, but it illustrates that prophets shouldn't be separated from their cultural context. Brigham Young believed there were people living on the moon. Why? Probably because that's what newspapers were reporting. It's known as the great moon hoax. Does falling for the hoax make him a false prophet? No, just a prophet that was also a product of his time. He was his own person and he had his own opinion. God doesn't want his prophets, for better or worse, just to be his puppets. <laughs> Additionally, prophets are not omniscient. Being a prophet doesn't make them the smartest person on the planet. An apostle, M. Russell Ballard, said, I worry sometimes that members expect too much from church leaders and teachers, expecting them to be experts in subjects well beyond their duties and responsibilities. The Lord called the apostles and prophets to invite others to come unto Christ. Our primary duty is to build up the church, teach the doctrine of Christ, and help those in need of help. Okay, I need to, I need to stop and, and just say something about this. Um, one, the whole issue of the, the people on the moon. Again, it was a ridiculous thing, and whether or not newspapers were reporting it, I don't know. I haven't researched that that much. But if... Brigham was truly a prophet of God and he was saying these things in sermons. These things are recorded in the Journal of Discourses. They're recorded as part of his teachings. If he were truly a prophet of God, would not God, I'm, I'm sure if, if I were God, and, and I'm, thank God I'm not, but if I were and I had a prophet representing me and my word on earth and he started talking nonsense about people living on the moon i might fill him into the truth just saying and so here this whole thing about people expecting too much from the prophets and not being experts in these fields and whatever and blah 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 but yet they speak on them and they speak on them in the name of the lord and so what you're saying is they're speaking in the name of the lord but they're screwing it up there's a problem there there's a serious problem there we often say that God communicates or talks to his prophets. But what does that mean? Do they sit down and have Sunday brunch together? Having fun? Probably not how it works. Most of the time when they receive revelation from God, just like for you and me, it's a process. It takes effort. Yes, sometimes there are miraculous visions and there's very clear communication, but more often than not, prophets are left to seek as much inspiration as possible while using their best judgment. They prayerfully make the best decisions they can, and God either says, sure, sounds good, or nope, that's a bad idea, or even, that's a bad idea, but I'm going to let it play out and help you learn from your mistakes later on. Okay, see, this is not what a prophet, according to the office of prophet, biblically does. There, This is just a regular person that is reading the word or doing these things and, and 
working this stuff out. This is not how God worked through his prophets because we have these tests that show what a prophet is. Deuteronomy 18, um, Jesus talks about the, the prophets in the gospels and by their fruits you will know them. This is, this is not true of a prophet. This may be true, true of David and me. You know, I may have to read through the word and try to think and then learn from mistakes and so on, misinterpretation and, and whatever. But biblically, a prophet was somebody that received that from God. And God is not giving misinformation to his prophets to take out and present to the people. He just doesn't. This is, this is not what a prophet does. And what he is describing here is enough, according to Deuteronomy 18, to disqualify that man as a prophet. Now, can they still be a Christian? Not a Mormon prophet, but any, uh, you know, and that's why we don't have, we don't have prophets in the Christian church, office of prophets in, in this manner anymore. God isn't just trying to tell us stuff. He's trying to teach us stuff. This kind of a process is evident in the Bible when it comes time for the 11 apostles to fill the space left by Judas. In Acts 1, we read, And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship for which Judas by transgression fell. And they gave forth their lot, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. They prayed for inspiration, and then counseled together, made the best decision they could, and called Matthias. Presum you just contradicted what the word said. Literally. Yeah, they, 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 they narrowed down to two. They probably prayed about it. They probably counseled on that. But then they cast lots, and they said, God, you decide. And, and casting lots was... A game of chance, essentially. It was flipping a coin or it was um, rolling dice. That is what casting lots was. And it was them saying, Lord, we are going to trust that, that you are sovereign and you are going to determine the outcome of this. It would be like me saying, okay, God, I'm going to flip a coin 17 times. And if this is your will, let it come out heads all 17 times. Highly unlikely. And so that's what they did with the lots. Literally the opposite of what David is telling you right now that they did. Yeah, I'm sure they, they counseled and they talked and they narrowed it down to two. But then they said, God, you decide. They didn't make a decision and hope that God was okay with it. He's literally lying right now. And he just read that verse. Presumably with a thumbs up from God. No, not just with a thumbs up from God, with the determining factor being God. God caused those lots to fall upon Matthias because that's who God had chosen. What's so hard to figure out about that? It's a game of chance. It is not, I don't know what he thinks casting lots is. I'm, I'm a, it seems to me like he thinks it's a ballot system. Like they, okay, we're voting and then we're going to count. No, because we see just earlier that the the Roman soldiers cast lots for Christ's clothing it was a gam it was a gamble it was gambling it was like saying okay God we're gonna flip over you know so many cards and, and the highest card gets the the shot and you determine it it is he's literally contradicting contradicting the scripture that he just read Sometimes God will reveal a broad principle to the prophet and apostles. For example, temples are important and people need to be spiritually prepared before they go there. And then the prophet and apostles have to figure out the best policies to implement or apply that revelation. For example, deciding to start using temple recommends and doing recommend interviews. In ancient times, there were real prophets and false prophets. In modern times, there are real prophets and false prophets. God has given us the Holy Ghost to be able to discern who is who. And we'll talk more about that in another episode. In the meantime, check out the article on our website for more info on... 
All right, and so we already talked about that in another episode. We talked about the the feelings and so on. God does not leave the the test of a prophet to our feelings. It's not just the the praying and, and letting the Holy Spirit reveal it. He has given us tests in his word. He has given us in Deuteronomy 18. He's given us, I probably should have put a bookmark in here before. Um, yeah, you know. Live... Deuteronomy 18.22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. There is a specific test for a prophet in Deuteronomy. And then Jesus tells us later, he says that by their fruits you will know them. That, and, he, and he's specifically referring to false prophets. By their fruits you should know them. Paul tells us that if an, even an angel comes to you and presents a different gospel, that he is anathema. Even a, 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 an angel come and give, I mean, it's almost eerily like Paul is talking about the, the advent of Mormonism 1,800 years after he is talking to, to the, the church. And he's saying, um, if someone comes with a false gospel, so here's the thing. Character issues. I mean, we have we have uh, we have a um, in Titus and Timothy we have requirements for an elder. We have requirements for an overseer, which I think could be applied to a uh, a prophet. Joseph and Brigham both fail, um, disqualify themselves according to those requirements. Um, so, but character aside, what they were like and and so on aside. Um, and those are not, this is not what I would use or most apologists would use to, to prove or disprove uh, Joseph Brigham or any of these others as false prophets. What we would use is their own words. The Doctrine and Covenants, all these little, little papers in here, um, majority of these, are all false prophecies. These are all prophecies that Joseph gave as scripture that failed. Um, you know, things like uh, the temple in Missouri, um, the land in Missouri, the Civil War, United Order, um, the Second Coming. You know, all these places where Joseph gave prophecy and they failed. And that disqualifies him as a prophet. Uh, character aside, money digging, um, polygamy, uh, destroying printing presses because they're they're saying questionable things about him. All those things aside, Joseph Smith gave false prophecies. And the ultimate thing, the ultimate, uh, is the fact that they they have presented a false gospel. And then I want to leave with with one verse um, in Hebrews. And again, here is telling us that we no longer need prophets. God, who, and this is Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, and 2, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in the time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed the heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. So, here we, we see that, that prophets are no longer necessary because we've had the 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 final prophet um, in our prophet priest and king uh, Jesus um, has given us his word and so but again the ultimate bottom line is the fact that the the Mormon prophets continue to present a false gospel a gospel of works a gospel that requires you to do temple um, ceremonies and so on in order to receive your exaltation those are not that's not a biblical gospel and they present a false Christ they do not recognize Christ as the creator that Hebrews just said by whom all things were made in John 1 it talks about all things that are made were made by him by Jesus but yet the Mormons consider him something that was made he is a spiritual offspring of Elohim and, and Heavenly Mother and the spiritual brother of Lucifer and every single one of us. 
So they they present a false Christ and they present a false gospel. You know, David has spent so much all this time defending the the poor character, and he doesn't even defend the poor character. He just throws up comparison. You know, well, you know, they weren't as bad as this guy, or this guy was did stuff bad too. You know, it's the what aboutism. It's what our our modern uh, um, politics is based on all the time. The Republicans are going, well, the 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 Democrats did it. Well, weren't you mad when the Democrats did it? Then why are you doing it? You know. We look back on what the prophets did in the, in the Old Testament and we recognize that those things were not quite good. They were sinful. Doesn't justify um, Joseph and, and Brigham and so on going on and doing what I would consider to be worse things. So, there you have it. it it's not about character and not about any of those things. Ultimately, it falls to the fact that they preach a false gospel and they're leading people astray and they're, they're creating a, an entire church, uh, an entire demographic of people who I am convinced will approach Jesus on the day of judgment and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do these things in your name? And he's going to look at every person who, who went into eternity believing in the lies of Mormonism, he's going to look at each one of them and say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And I'm also convinced that every LDS prophet is going to have to stand by and watch as every person that he deceived receives that statement from Christ and is cast into hell before he himself hears it and is cast into hell. And so my, my, I'm begging you, LDS listener, watcher, go read John 1, 1 through 18 and see that it condemns everything that is taught doctrinally in your church. And turn from the false gospel, turn from the false Christ, and repent and put your faith and trust in Jesus the true Jesus who created all things, who is God incarnate and God almighty and God eternal. Put your faith and your trust in him. For the rest of you, as always, preach the gospel at all times. Use words. They're necessary. And until next week, Soli Deo Gloria.